Good morning. Isn't it beautiful here? It's a, a really lovely spot. If you look to the hills the, and the woods, um, we should acknowledge that this is Tangurung country. Always was, always will be. And um, the Tangurung are the first people of the river and the mountains here. And they were connected through the Wang and Bunjil moieties. That's crow and wedgetail eagle. And so I pay my respects to Tangurung elders, past, present, and emerging. This word country has come to mean more in Australia than back in England. In the first few years of invasion, um, indigenous people in Australia had to learn English quickly because they had to urgently communicate concepts. And one of the earliest indigenous uses of this word country that's recorded is back in the first, those first few years, they, they told us those trees there, they're our countrymen. And there's a lot in that. I think we're still, we still have to work to understand what that relationship is, what they're telling us there. Those trees, they're our countrymen. Now, um, I'd like to start, Neil, with you. <laughs> we, um, <laughs> we, um, we live in Bundjalung country, Wittabur country. And um, I'd like you to talk about what it's like to sit with, to work with, a plant that's evolved in the part of country that you now call home. Okay. Uh, I've lived in the, the one spot, northern New South Wales, just near Nimbin, um, for the last 40-something years. Uh, now, for the first 10, 15, I mean, I, what are my qualifications? I'm a high school dropout and a dumbass muso, you know, and I have gobbled a lot of different things over the years, and I've grown a few plants, you know. Um, my first 20 years in my home, um, I was regularly consuming psychedelics in my home, and I live in the middle of a forest. I'm surrounded by rainforest and dry sclerophyll forest as well. It's borderland country. Um, just up across the, across the Nimbin Valley on the other side is an ancient rock, rock basically, Nimbin Rocks it's called. Now it's according to what, we, what us white folk know, and, and let's face it, the, <laughs> the indigenous mob are smart enough at this point not to tell us too much. Um, but according to what we know, that's a very ancient initiation site for the, for the males. Apparently it's a male, male area, they reckon. Blue Knob's the other side, that's the female area. But the, first, the only tree that grows on that, tr on that rock is a uh, Acacia obtusifolia, which some of you probably know what that means or signifies. It's a DMT tree, to put it in scientific terms. Now, I'd smoked DMT an awful lot of times, synthetic DMT, in my house, and I'd had wonderful experiences. I loved it. I could... I could I could smoke a joint of it, get incredibly high, have a oneness experience, then make dinner for the kids. Cool. Um, and so I sp spent a lot of time looking for, an, look, looking, for, looking for it, basically, and I didn't get it very often because it was a bit of a rarity. But then back in the 90s, various people realised that you could abstract a fairly highly concentrated tryptamine substance from the Acacia obtusifolia. So suddenly I had as much DMT as I could possibly want. The very first time I smoked the stuff in my home, in the forest. It was so different to all the other experiences I'd had with synthetic DMT. Now, you know, I'm a pretty rational, fairly objective person. I, I don't like to um, project what could easily be just my own head onto the external reality. I think that's a bit of a confusion. You just gotta keep observing and taking notes. But all I can say is what it really felt like was as soon as I had my first puff of the, of the acacia in my backyard, was like this big old being. I don't want to project anything here. I don't want to get too anthropomorphic, but a big old being going, ooh, humans again. And it was welcoming. It was warm. It was friendly. Um, every time since. I mean, I think most people, when they take a strong dose of anything, tend to, there's, there's a gut response. And I, I believe it's just <laughs> the basic ego's fear of dissolution, but there's a, a gut response. You're always a little bit nervous that it's going, oh, what, what if? And personally, I've never had a bad experience in my place, in, in my home, in my country, um, on the local species. And the same could have been said for the mushrooms to a degree, but they're a foreign thing that's come in until we found the eucalyptus mushrooms. Thank you. <laughs> um, communication. You, um, you've been travelling from country to country in this country, um, looking for 
acacias of different sorts and getting to know them and, and listening to them. Can you talk a bit about what that's like? Yeah, certainly. Um, I actually see these trees as expressions of the place and when I consume the alkaloids they produce, my experiences have predominantly been interactions with the intelligence of these trees as an expression of the place. So having said that, um, with the ever-increasing interest in this alkaloid DMT and wild harvesting becoming more rampant, I think it's incredibly important that we begin to um, establish harmonious ways to interact with these incredibly important plant medicines. And I think the most, uh, the best way to do that is actually by growing the plant and cultivating a relationship through the growing process. Thank you. Um, Tanya, you're just back from taking a bunch of people out bush, which is what you do best. <laughs> and with your writing and a six season calendar and you, um, you encourage people to engage with country. And um, you were also talking with me about uh, compassionate ecology, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what that means. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I work in the um, traditional ecology arena, which is um, biodiversity conservation in a very, I guess, anthropocentric management sense. It is based on the science of ecology, so we look at the Australian environment and we see what's threatening it. And it's things like habitat loss or destruction, uh, which is the hardest to deal with because you have to stop development on a large scale. But other things are also um, so-called pest animals and also weed species. And as a, a nature lover and an animal lover, um, I felt a little bit like um, I was participating in um, quite a bit of uh, killing as part of my job because I would, um, in my work, apply for grants to get money to help landholders uh, kill their rabbits. So I wasn't actually killing rabbits myself, but it's part of my job. And um, But I've been working in this arena for nearly 20 years and I know it's uh, backed by good science, but I was really thrilled to hear that there are ecologists who are exploring a, um, a new synergy which is called compassionate conservation. And I went to a conference just um, less than a month ago and it was a, um, an intersection of um, animal ethics, um, environmental philosophy um, and traditional biodiversity conservation that used um, a little bit of Aristotle logic to actually think what are we doing and why are we doing it and there's these principles and the first one is first do no harm and instead of just straight away going to killing as the first option as a management tool are there other ways that we can look at and manage the problem? Uh, manage the problem, or maybe the problem isn't a problem at all. And um, I got a lot out of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems and there's a lot of killing, and any kind of intersection of of, um, of modalities that help people reflect and apply management actions um, from a place of heart, I think, is a really a really a good thing. And for me. Um, if you're really an ecologist who loves nature and who loves um, animals, you're probably already doing that anyway. Um, I can segue nicely onto you, Torsten. Um, our valley is um, filling with psychotria because the um, foreign psychotria, because the birds love them. Um, unfortunately, it's not psychotria viridis, it's carthaginensis. Um, I... You've, um, you set up Shaman Australis Botanicals a long time ago. It's the longest running ethnoentheogenic um, nursery in Australia. And there were the supporting news groups for so long, the, the boards, the discussion boards. Um, it gives you a good perspective um, on who among us gardens and what are we looking for, what plants are we buying and what questions do we have. Can you tell us a bit? Yeah, just first to the psychiatry of Carthaginensis. Um, yeah, we got the same problem. Yeah. Um, I've spent the last um, <laughs> damn birds. Th three, three months trying to kill as many of them as possible because they've just spread down, down the valley on, on, still on our property, so it's easy to control. 
but um, I figured I'd get them before they spread too far. Um, as on what people buy, it's it's sort of um, it's pretty much the same as what people are interested in. So um, yeah, the the big thing for the last few years has obviously been Ayahuasca. Um, for the last year or two, uh, probably being rivaled by um, uh, cacti. That's not just for entheogenic use, um, but just because people are mad about cacti. Um, and it's very, it's a very trendy sort of fashionable thing where they, um, yeah, something that was selling really well a couple of years ago is not selling at all anymore because it's too ordinary. Um, yeah, the big thing, uh, I guess a year ago or so was uh, mutants. Um, now it's variegates. So, um, but yeah, in general, like <laughs> the the way we even approach our customers when they walk in, we ask them whether they've been here before. Um, and if they say no, we ask them what they're interested in. And in most cases, if they haven't been there before, it, the answer is Ayahuasca. So probably 80% of our customers uh, come in to inquire about Ayahuasca plants. So n not just not just Ayahuasca vine itself, not not just the Benoteropsis carpi, but um, you know, all the um, other plants that can be used as well. It's interesting to hear how enticing Ayahuasca is to so many of us around the world as well. I think Ayahuasca's doing a fine job of getting out there and traveling. <laughs> it's actually uh, coming straight out of the mainstream. So um, whenever it gets mentioned, whenever there's a horror story on, on, on the news, uh, yeah, we suddenly get flooded with inquiries. Um, we, yeah, we had to shut our server down a couple of times because <laughs> we ended up on television on, on the news. Um, and it just increases the, um, uh, yeah, the interest so much, but only for like a day or two. And then, then the more... Uh, serious interested people will, yeah, they'll come back. Dr. Days, you and I have been gardening together for nearly a quarter of a century, and our garden is overflowing with gosh. It's also, um, we, we only have a hectare, and um, we're growing five, six varieties of Benisteriopsis. Can you tell me what happens when they grow up? Well, yes, I, I don't think many people appreciate what kind of organism Benisteriopsis carpi is. And um, it's a very, very large liana. So if you live in the subtropics or the tropics, there are a number of considerations. It will grow up a very tall tree very quickly. It will uh, stop light getting to that tree and kill it. The tree will become weakened at the base. And in our environment, it's very important not to plant it with anything to the east because a, a storm with a westerly wind will then bring that... Uh, vine-covered tree down onto whatever is to the east of it. So one thing we've learnt is to give these plants a lot of space and make sure that there's nothing that we uh, don't want to get crushed too close to a Benisteriopsis carpi. So it's it's interesting for us. I, I think our main focus was conservation and still is conservation. I'm interested in plants that are, are, are rare or threatened or, or that I feel need a, a little bit of help with their uh, genetic diversity uh, and, and conservation. But... These plants are also um, experiments when they come into new places. It's a complete experiment. How will this species behave? Because they are agents. They're not... It's funny because plant sort of has the implication of being set in place. You know, you put it there and it's kind of passive about it. But they are agents. They do all sorts of things, including evolving. Uh, so um, we are finding that there are interesting decisions, different kind of paradoxes and conundrums uh, when species that don't reproduce normally decide to reproduce from seed. Uh, we'll get on to that in a we'll while. We'll get on to it later. Yep. But yeah, things are changing as well. Mm. Yeah. Torsten, you want to respond? Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to comment on that um, because uh, the first time I went up to Far North Queensland, um, I was looking for Hawaiian baby woodrose and what I found was Captain Cook vine, which is a close relative. And the way it grows is um, a, a truck or something will carry a seed onto the side of the road. The vine will grow up a tree grow a canopy over the tree, the tree collapses, falls into the rainforest, smashes open a whole big area, all the weeds come up, including thousands of Captain Cook vine seeds that go onto the next tree. I saw areas where the Captain Cook vine only arrived uh, five years ago and it had already killed several acres mm. uh, of trees. So um, it's an incredibly fast process. And after seeing that, and then after realising how Benetriopsis carpi grows, um, we actually don't send carpi to um, the final Queensland. I expect she makes her own way there. <laughs> uh, we know it's there, but we don't want to be responsible for it. Yeah, 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 cool. Ellen, you know our garden. Um, it's, not, it's not Versailles. Um, it's not what? It's not Versailles. It's somewhere, somewhere closer to wild than that, I guess. 
Um, can you tell us a bit or can you help us think about what um, gardening cultures, uh, the variety of gardening cultures and uh, what gardening is a practice, how that can change us? Yeah, I have been to your garden and it is an actu actually one of the most amazing places, you know, in such a small area that so many plants can grow. And uh, when I first came to Australia here in about 2001 and um, I was introduced to a garden and it was my first experience of watching plants grow in the subtropics and seeing the rate at which plants could grow from seed to a fully bloomed plant and it completely blew my mind. And I took on as a spiritual practice that the garden was my teacher. And I would wake up at dawn, sometimes before dawn, and go out with a head torch because it was just every moment of the day the garden would have a, a lesson. And so some, from a philosophical point of view, you know, to really take on board what gardening means and to have the garden and the plants as a teacher means that we have to be really willing to let go of preconceived ideas. We have to be willing to experience failure. We have to be willing to surrender to forces beyond our control. And that just even gardening on a veranda with one, one or two little plants, uh, to take that perspective spiritually and philosophically, that, that the, the plants are teachers in a real sense, and, and to really take responsibility for what that means. I'm thinking now of the, the, the grass that gets up um, around waist height or chest height at our place, and Des tells me that's called panic. <laughs> um, the garden teaches us every day. Um, Alan, you've told us that um, when you sell products at Happy High Herbs, a lot of what you include with that product is information. So, um, Snoo, I'd like to move to you because when I think of information, I think of your Garden of Eden tome and just how much information is, is in there. I know you're working on a second edition where you're, you know, where possible going from secondary sources to primary sources. And those primary sources include the plants themselves, so you will nibble them or smoke them and so on, as you do, just to get that data. I'm wondering, when you write, um, do you also invite the plants to take on an editorial role? And what I'm thinking here is, <coughs> when Des spoke about the Solanaceae here, and he put his presentation together, before he finalised that presentation, he chewed some Brugmansia leaves. Mm. And I wonder whether you do have s similar practices. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the only reason I'm in this is because I really love plants and I want to listen to what they're trying to tell me. And um, if there's ever advice coming from that realm, i listen to it very much. Um, one of the reasons why I didn't break up the book into two volumes, because it's kind of a two-part section book, um, a lot of people said, well, why don't you just split it up and have two separate volumes and that would make it easier to print. Um, I was concerned that a lot of the safety information was in the first volume and I, I had a um, very extreme mushroom experience on one occasion while I was working on this and I was getting a very clear message that it was vitally important that I did not separate them in case someone had it and then lost the first volume and they would just refer to all the, the so-called goodies, what they wanted to um, get out of plants but not have the information about how to safely approach this because this is a a dangerous practice or it can be if you're not careful a lot of plants are very safe but a lot of them are not so safe There's a, lot, a lot of sacred plants that can easily kill you if you don't treat them with respect or take them in a correct way or, or if you don't know how to detoxify them or make them safer and um, yeah these are friends and family and uh, if, if they're talking I listen <laughs> and uh, I, I try and try as many of these plants as I can, as long as I feel safe doing so. <laughs> I'm delighted at the idea of mushrooms giving uh, harm reduction advice. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's talking about listening to plants. Um, as you say, in our garden, some, uh, it's a very fecund garden. And um, so a plant that, I'm not sure if it's entirely a clone, where it comes from, from the mosaic, but Salvia divinorum um, set seed abundantly in our garden. Um, can you tell us about Voyager and whether you have any idea of how we'll engage with Voyager's siblings? Yes, this was a, a question. It was, uh, for me, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, mostly Salvia, Di Salvia Divinorum exists in this country as the Bonnell clone, which is often called the uh, Watson and Hoffman clone, but uh, it's actually a collection by Bonnell. Uh, there's virtually, well, there's very little genetic diversity amongst c 
uh, amongst the, uh, the commercial collections of these, these salvia divinorum plants. But within our garden, there are a number of pollinators that do pollinate the flowers. And so in spring, we, I pay attention to what seed has been set by both the spine bills, uh, a long-billed bird that, uh, that drinks the nectar and pollinates the plants, and also um, hoverflies, uh, a bee kind of thing that mimics, well, it's a fly that mimics a bee. In any case, there are a lot of seeds produced, which means that there's this new genetic diversity in Salvia divinorum. Uh, and uh, I tried to get to know the plants, very slow actually. I, I wish I had more time to explore uh, chewing the leaves of the different individuals to find out what their character is like. But what, I've, what surprised me is that some of them are not the same personality that I would expect. I, I, when I chew the banal clone, I always encounter a feminine presence. Uh, to me, she's like an auntie. And she's quite stern, very compassionate, but very stern. But always I encountered this feminine presence. So when I was chewing Voyager, I encountered someone else. This was a plant that had never interacted with humans, a salvia divinorum plant, but a new one. And its personality was different. It was uh, like an adolescent male to me, urbane, um, uh, good-natured, uh, enthusiastic, still with the same faculties, the same capacity. So both um, the, I suppose, miracles of heal healing would be one of its arcana, but also the power of being in two places simultaneously. So it had both of these talents, just like uh, other salvia divinorum has. Uh, but its character, its personality, and its way of engaging with me was different. Uh, so I don't know if this will be something that I find more as I explore different individuals, whether it's related to the way that it's evolving in this country, in a new context. Uh, but uh, to me, that was really um, surprising. Thank you, Des. And uh, Kathleen, um, when Des taught a course at the University of Queensland many years ago called Drugs and Religion, um, he had great fun putting together the reading lists. And he tells me the most popular item on the reading list was your chapter in Sisters of the Extreme mm. about Salvia Divinorum. So I wonder if you could respond to Des's story about Voyager. Um, well, it's very interesting. And um, just botanically, didn't there have to be another uh, variety around for it to set seed? Or did you, you were just working from a single clone? And from a single clone. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, Yes, uh, I have the experience of many years ago having a, a clone of the Bonnell or the Wasson Hoffman um, that I took to Hawaii. And then uh, um, Brett Blosser, who's an anthropologist who's done work with and published on Salvia, and a friend, he gave me a clone he collected. All of these, if you don't know, come from the um, Sierra Mazateca or the, the Mazatec Mountains of northeastern Oaxaca in southern Mexico. And, um, and then I've done 23 years of field work there, and I was once, they were very excited to take me to a hidden forest patch of, of a new variety that they said had la fuerza, the force, and uh, more of the force, because we'd done ceremony together, me and this Mazatec family. And uh, so I brought back that one, and I've cultivated it for many years and taken it out to Hawaii too, where they, oh, you know, storms come and people aren't tracking things and the ID gets lost and that happens. So they've all, like, mixed it up. And um, I'm not sure how to, uh, how to sort that out. I, too, I wish I had or set aside more time to meditate. Uh, you know, it's a deep, instant meditation that then you have to mull over for quite a long time. And so personal research um, can have to clear the deck for it. Uh, so I'm not sure about all those. It, it does seem to be doing something out here in the world, something different. That's true. It's it's meeting other cousins, and uh, but also, you know, I think some of us have wondered as these plants, ayahuasca and the cicotrias and these various uh, plants, as they've moved away from their place of origin, um, you know, are they? searching for knowledge in a way too, for experience too, and then are they having a different experience out here with us? And they're not only being mirrors and reflecting us, but they're actually absorbing something of 
their surroundings perhaps, the other plants that they've never even dreamt of before that are here, and our, our level of inquiry, which is different than the traditional level in a very small part of Mexico where these have persisted for so long, but until late 20th century not known anywhere else. So uh, they're, they're, they're uh, quickly evolving, I would say, mm. in terms of what they are seeing, offering, and how they're mixing together. Thank you. It would be hard not to believe that these plants are alert and curious and not just about humans. And that's one of the things that um, that phrase, um, those trees are our countrymen, suggests to me. Of course, the trees and the humans are not the only countrymen here. And I would expect the plants, and certainly a skilled plant like salvia, to be interested in whole systems, mm -hmm. more than capable of that. Mm -hmm. Some of what we're talking about here is the size and shape of plant spirits. Um, when Keeper Trout sp spoke here last time, um, he reminded us that all of these assays of what chemicals um, different plants contain, we shouldn't take the literature as the, the final story. We have to know plants at an individual level as well. Um, and we know this with um, selecting seeds for good potatoes and tomatoes. It's the same with the entheogenic plants. Um, so Torsten, I wonder, can you tell us um, who is Mrs. Eileen? And um, why is it such a fun idea to um, think of pollinating her? And why is that faintly grouse? <laughs> um, so Eileen is a, uh, a cactus clone. Um, uh, it was brought into the community by a, um, a member of the SAB forums, the Core Overy, uh, and um, the guy that did that uh, named it after his mum. So, um, uh, and his mum thought it was grouse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. So, um, plants and personalities, there's, um, it's an awkward story um, um, about uh, dumb cane. And... Um, so Diffenbachia, uh, the leaves contain, if I, I'm simplifying, but shards of poisonous glass, essentially. Slave owners used to feed it to um, disobedient slaves so that their mouths would swell up and they wouldn't be able to speak. So it's, it's known as dumb cane. But um, you, you encountered um, Diffenbachia spirit in a much more positive um, and helpful way. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, it was positive uh, for the people I was trying to facilitate for, um, but we we were it, it's a you know, we have to make choices on the spur of the moment sometimes with different priorities. Uh, but we were sitting in darkness and we were consulting uh, Salvia. We were, we were uh, seeking direction, uh, seeking healing. And it was uh, the new moon, very dark, we, we were trying to create a quiet environment. And a dog on the street started barking. And each bark would break through the trance quite abruptly. It was very difficult to stay in the trance and to hear the, the, the nosos of the plant with the dog barking. And uh, after a few barks, a, a, like a psychic tap on the shoulder, uh, the Diffenbachia plant came to me in vision and said, Shall I, you know, that dog, um, quieten it for, so that, you know, I thought, well, yeah, this is a very delicate moment. Um, I would appreciate it if the dog was quiet. And the, the different back here sort of nodded uh, assent to that. And uh, the dog stopped barking. And we resumed the, the trance. So the, the spirits can be, um, they seem to be available telepathically to people who are sensitive to plant intelligences as well. They can come in in the context of, of another kind of trance. And uh, it's an unusual psychology, to say the least. Um, but uh, also very interesting that it seemed to correlate with a real-world effect as well. Uh, so kind of magical thinking. And without any evidence that the dog actually chewed on the different back here, so that's comforting. Yeah, it was just an extension of its energy. Yeah. Um, Snoo, um, in your talk yes yesterday, is it only yesterday, about um, <coughs> pituri and tobacco, 
and plants um, that are like pituria tobacco or substitutes for pituria tobacco or used like pituria tobacco. Um, you showed us one grass that um, it had been described as being chewed like tobacco, but you suspect it's more being chewed like sugarcane. Mm. I'm interested in these different categories because they're not very precise. No. There's a plant that we had seen, um, um, we've been looking for, it's an amorphophallus um, from the Daly River in the Northern Territory. And we'd seen a report that it was, I think, smoked like tobacco, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. It was also described as a cheeky bugger plant. <laughs> mm. And I think it's good to remember that some of our countrymen are cheeky buggers. Do you come across that concept much in, in the literature? And this was a missionary, I think, writing 100 years ago. Yeah, it comes across a lot in the literature, also with personal communications, but um, it's hard to generalise. Some people like to think, oh, that's definitely an indication that this plant is psychoactive in some way, um, and that's not always the case. Sometimes it's because a plant might have prickly thorns or something that irritates you when you touch it, um, or may just straight out be poisonous. There are a variety of reasons people can refer to plants as being cheeky. Um, particularly like um, yams, um, Dioscoria mm. yams, commonly eating, eaten as food, but they also have a lot of sacred significance in Northern Australia and Papua New Guinea, and they're often described as being cheeky. Some of these are definitely psychoactive, also possibly a bit dangerous, but um, usually I think they're referred to as being cheeky because of their poisonous potential. You can use them as food, but if you don't prepare them properly, um, or if you use the wrong type that's too strong to be able to prepare properly, um, they're called cheeky, but in other senses, with psychoactive plants, um, people are less likely to elaborate on this much. They might just say that's it, that plant's cheeky and give you a bit of a wink and leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, you know, you can figure it out for yourself if you're so inclined. In terms of the amorphophallus, if I could just say, the reason I didn't include that yesterday was because when I traced that back to its original sources, there was no clear mention that it was actually smoked as a tobacco. It definitely has been smoked in the past, um, but it's a rather dangerous plant. It's probably not something to be recommended. It has been said that if you smoke too much, you don't wake up again. And um, for most of it, that's probably not what we're looking for. <laughs> that's uh, very cheeky. <laughs> I... Um, we, we, in our community, we have these, these words, um, plant teachers, plant guides. There's often a lot of reverence, and um, sometimes we like to think of plants as gods and goddesses as well, but I, I like to think of ayahuasca as cheeky, um, and a few more of them as well. So, um, yeah, good concept. Um, Kathleen, you were talking um, about how we're not the only people to be encountering these. Um, you know, we Westerners, we rich Westerners, are not the only people to be encountering these plants. They're on the move quite generally. So even within Brazil, there are a lot of urban people encountering ayahuasca. Um, and uh, the peyote, for example, um, the Native American church has um, helped peyote spread to communities that don't live in peyote country. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's a big trade in plant parts, but what I'm wondering as well is the trade in um, specifically gardening cultures or cultivation cultures. Do you know whether... Um, gardening cultures are moving with the plants. Hmm. You mean the sort of people who might have been trading ornamentals or tomatoes or something for a long time and now they're trading these as well into well, I those guess gardening the, cultures? The kind of knowledge or the values or um, how to engage with these plants and I guess I'm thinking as well because garden is um, at one end of a spectrum where wilderness is at another end. And there are plants like the Ceba, did Ceba speciosa? Ceba pentandrum. Pentandrum, which is a plant of the forest. You mm -hmm. wouldn't plant it in your garden except we have. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that kind of knowledge, you know, what plants do you put close to your house, for example? We put our mm -hmm. peyote quite far from the house because we've read that they chatter a lot and mm -hmm. you can't sleep soundly if they're mm -hmm. close by. And, that makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that kind of knowledge moving? Well, I know about it in uh, the traditions that I've worked in. Um, there are plants that you always uh, put toward the edge, toward boundaries, because they're like a soft filter to keep out what you don't want. And, and that might be widely known in a place like Ecuador or, or Mexico or among Native Americans and, and probably here. And then among to the extent that we're either actually learning traditional information or 
really using our deep intuition um, in psychedelic culture as well. Mm. I, um, I, I think we've been in a gap. Like when I look at uh, uh, European settlers in the States, they came from all different parts of Europe and had, you know, Italian people had certain beliefs about all sorts of things, how you use plants in mm. the house too. You know, somebody has a cold, you go cut open an apple and set it beside their bed um, under under a glass and uh, overnight and then in the morning you take take it covered to the window and you hurl them outside and it's absorbed the, you know, that kind of ritual thinking which goes into the garden as well, mm -hmm. where you plant things, what you plant things with, were many different traditions that came from other places because we're all settlers and then kind of got woven together but very much I think just dissolved. And mm -hmm. so I, I wouldn't say, at least coming from the States, I wouldn't say that generally uh, gardeners have um, have have set out into that body of knowledge, and that it's become kind of that it's riding along yet with mm. the seeds and the starts. But we are a nursery of a lot of different kinds of thinking. That's what the psychedelic culture is, I think. You know, and so we influence that, and we we put our seeds and our stories out there a little bit in our ways of thinking, and and I and I think that level of sensitivity. Yeah. Is, is one of the ways we can contribute to the larger conversation. Yeah. Yes, gardening, um, gardening makes us gardeners. Um, <laughs> you know, when we cultivate the garden, we cultivate ourselves and we become gardeners, and that is a special thing. Mm -hmm. um, so when a, um, a dear friend of ours, a perfumer, died earlier this year, um, there's told the beehive, because that's what gardeners do. We share big news with the bees. Um, communication. Um, we suspect, well, we know there is oral tradition around countrymen, including acacias, including the ones with the fuerza, with the force. Um, but that knowledge, those traditions are hard to access. It takes time. Um, can you tell us what you do to get to know the plants uh, without those connections to the cultures, how do you listen to the plants and what do they tell you? Certainly. Well, for me, as I said before, the best way to get to know a plant medicine spirit is by growing the plant and understanding it and engaging in that symbiotic relationship and where you nurture the seed to tree to fruition. Um, once this relationship is established, for me that starts to carry over into the medicine space and my experiences with the medicine. But other ways to do it are, if, if you're going to visit these trees in their natural environments, one of the things that I will do is I'll go out there and I'll just sleep out in the open uh, on the first night by myself. and Because I think sleep is one of the most vulnerable states we can put ourselves in. So putting ourselves in this vulnerable state, in this environment. I often get communications from the land or the trees themselves communicating to me in either dreams or hypnagogic state. And so there's not just one way to establish a relationship with plant medicine. It's not just about consuming it. It's, there's multiple different angles to approach these things. And I think um, it actually is a, it, it requ it requires a multi-pronged approach, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's listening to country. Country will tell you about plants. Yeah, and the one thing to say is that I don't have any first-hand interaction with Indigenous people on this subject, and so I know it's potentially a very sensitive area, and that's why I very carefully um, am, am constantly in communication with the intelligence of these trees to receive the guidance on how to progress. And you asked them, didn't you, about planting some of these acacias that have fuerza, planting them outside of the country where they evolved. What, what did they say? Yeah, so the first time I had acacia as a tea, it was with acacia cortia, and it presented itself to me as quite a young, down-to-earth and jovial masculine persona. And I actually took that to be the persona of that particular tree because at other times I experience what I see to be um, 
like an, an overarching intelligence of that species. And then beyond that, there seems to be this overarching acacia intelligence. So I can, I can never, um, I can never know what I'm going to interact with at any one time. Beyond that, I actually see these trees and most other plant medicines as ambassadors for the intelligence of nature. So in this first experience, I'd already preconceived the idea of distributing these sacred trees because, or growing them and getting other people involved in the growing process because I'd found it so beneficial to myself and understanding that wild harvesting is causing uh, more and more significant issues. And so I put the question to this intelligence of the tree. I said, what do you think about this? Is, would it be okay for me to collect seeds and to grow and distribute? And it said to me, if the seeds grow, grow them. And what I found in growing a lot of different species is there are species that are a lot more hesitant to grow. And I think that those are the ones that are uh, yeah, more hesitant, hesitant to move out into these different locations. And then there are other species who, uh, which germinate very readily and seem to be incredibly adaptable, despite the fact that sometimes they're microendemic. I'm thinking of um, a time that Des and I were tripping in our garden and looking at the different plants that we had brought in, um, thinking about Psychotria, Carthaginensis and some of the others, and um, just thinking about protocol because um, we don't have connection to even local Indigenous mob. Um, and we didn't ask permission to bring these, uh, these plants here. Um, and we wondered whether the plants, or to what extent the plants had their own protocol, so when we put them in the ground, the roots spread out and they encounter other roots and fungi and so on. And um, I guess we can only speculate about plants' mm -hmm. protocols for figuring out whether they belong there. And I think if you ask ayahuasca, ayahuasca would be very happy to be planted anywhere. Um, without, I think, asking permission. Um, Neil, um, there are many gardeners in and around Nimbin, and one of the things we grow is weed. Yes, and um, I'm just wondering what kind of gardening culture is cannabis culture? Oh. Ooh. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, at this point in time, a lot of it's commercially driven. And a lot of it's indoor, which I don't. I have a basic antipathy to do. They to are do. not gardeners. <laughs> no, well, that's what I figure. I like, I mean, what we call bush pot at home. I like pot that's actually grown outside. Um, look, I mean, one thing many dope growers have said to me over the years, and I, I know it myself, is that in the day-to-day -day mull of life, no matter how aware you are of the environment, no matter how you, uh, aware you are of your place in nature and, and of country, um, you know, there's something about the ego that just keeps growing. It's like a, a scab or a shit. It's like a scab. It grows back. You know, you, you've got to scrape it off re regularly. Um, a really good way of scraping it off for, for pot growers is to actually go out and grow pot because mm. immediately, you know, you're, you're, well, to get away with growing it, you have to go for a long, long walk usually through really beautiful country. And, you know, I've been living there for 45 years. When I first came there, I was astounded by how incredibly beautiful it was and it was like, wow, this is incredible. But, you know, as time goes on and the ego crustifies, you tend to <coughs> forget that and just concentrate on cooking dinner for the kids or writing a song or doing whatever you do, you know. Um, but if you've got to grow a, <laughs> a crop that year to pay for the dinner, um, you also have to go out into the bush, you have to go for a walk into the most beautiful spots and inevitably all the, f the farmers I know talk about that, about, oh, it's so good to get out, and I've, I've had to drag this bag of chicken shit for fucking five miles, but by God, it was a beautiful walk. You know, and I think that's one of the, the real gifts of gardening, and let's include pot farming as, as commando farming, as we say, in the gardening category. You know, it's, it's one of the gifts of nature back to us humans. I, I don't necessarily want to personify it. I, I'm, I've got, you know, I'm a, a fence sitter, really. Um, but by God, nature has always shown me a way forward. And, and when I get too disrespectful, as my ego gets bigger and bigger again, it's like old Ken Kesey said, sometimes it's like you're tripping and this <clears throat> hand grabs you by the scruff of the neck and said, you want to see the books? Look at the books. <laughs> <laughs> I could chat with these marvellous people all day, um, but I know also we have the best audiences here at EGA. Um, so this is the time where if you have a question, um, put up your hand and a microphone will find you.
food. <laughs> yes, potatoes are good. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's really a good idea to particularly identify a small number of plants and say these are the best ones to be growing because they're going to be the ones that are targeted the most, both by you know law enforcement and just by greedy people who want to make a quick buck. Um, I think the most important thing to grow is whatever plants call out to you and say, grow me. <laughs> um, you can gain so much from a relationship with growing any kind of plant. It doesn't have to be some species that's particularly high in DMT or anything like that. Just, just let a plant reach out and touch you and touch it back. <laughs> that's my advice. I would say work with the ones that you trust. So just, just think about it, feel what that's like, which plants do you just trust explicitly in whatever context it is. Just go with the ones you trust. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. Um, you know, one of the, as part of this community, obviously there's many sensitive people here and that level of sensitivity uh, uh, of being able to commune with those very subtle and precise spirits is one thing. The question I often ask is, is where do we really come from? And when I look at or, or, or listen to the story of the uh, indigenous people saying that tree over there is my countryman, and we really, from a perspective of the displaced people who we are, understand that it's, it's not just that that tree is a sort of spirit to them. Their ancestors are buried in the ground. And that tree's roots is entwined with the bones of those people's ancestors, with the people that live here and have lived here for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, the question I ask is, who are we and where do we come from? And how does the fact that we have a, a displaced relationship with that intrinsic sense of home affect our ability to, to really see and feel what, what is with the plants? And so I think that's just a really important thing to, to ponder. I mean, take a look at Genesis 3, 15, 17. This is our cultural myth. And in it, we are cast from the garden to toil and suffer. And those are the foods that you will eat, said God. And he almost was a bastard. <laughs> Check it out, Genesis 3, 15 to 17, because this is the cultural myth that we're actually carrying, whether we're aware of it or not. And so let's just, from that perspective, know where we're coming from and know that that, that is intrinsic to the way that we relate to the garden. I'd be saying, in my own experience, if you want to get really metaphysical about it, um, there's no real separation between us and these plants. Ultimately, we're all a projection of this one thing or a super brain or something like that. And um, so to talk about a plant spirit as being something that's entirely separate to us that may be communicating and how much we're colouring that, if you think of it in that extreme way, it's almost a meaningless question because the plant is us and we are the plant and that goes for everything and not just the things that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all as one big bouncing ball. Yeah. Mm. I don't work for the plants, I work for the planet. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I've had many, um, like, like all of us, I imagine if we're here, had many experiences of absolute oneness and that it's all one. But I, I also, um, you know, what people do, the way that mind works and the way what language is, is language itself is a classification system where we, you know, we identify parts of reality and we try to identify how they are related to the other parts and we name things and, um, and then work within that system. And I think you're right that it's another, you know, somewhat more grounded, um, and particulated uh, level than than the absolute oneness, but plant people, we we love to know the difference between one to another, and we do that. And medicine people do too. Herbalists do, and even food people and gardeners and uh, little children. I've just watched my granddaughter learn language, and it's all about 
what's this and what's that and how observing how this is like that but different and you know it's it's to me that's also enchanting and also wonderful it's one of the great things that humans do know how to do and so and it's not just the naming it's the understanding so who are you and what role do you play and am i can i know you is there a way to know you you know and and i i think that's equally beautiful to absolute oneness at least that's my yeah. my experience <laughs> Um, I'm not a very spiritual person, um, but I have the the same sort of uh, experiences that spiritual people do, uh, except for I don't think they come from the outside. I don't think it's entities outside. Um, I think it's things that are created in your brain, uh, which are um, yeah, considerably influenced by your um, set and setting and uh, yeah, your outside influences and your expectations. Um, not that it makes it any less amazing and, and wonderful and, and beautiful and um, mind-blowing, um, but I just don't think it comes from the outside. So for me, the plants, um, it's, um, yeah, it's, not, it's not necessarily a spirit as such. Yeah, it's, it's something that um, it just triggers something in yourself. Um, any more questions? Yes. Um, I have a question about uh, Selvia divinorum, particularly the clone available in Australia. Um, now, there is the idea that um, this plant, when taken, will affect different genders in different ways. Now, I'm not sure if this is an idea that's propagated and is colouring people's experiences because of the preconception, or whether it's a cultural, physiological, neurological, and um, in a modern society, how that might look for um, people where gen lines of gender are blurring. Sorry. Um, so we're the first importers of salvia into Australia um, a, as a commercial product. Um, we actually made the, um, the first salvia extracts that we exported back out to the US and, uh, and Europe. Um, this is in the uh, mid-90s, mid to late 90s. Um, so we were lucky that um, we got to see a lot of people who had salvia for the very, very first time. Um, and. They, most people didn't know anything about it. They'd never, never heard of it. They um, yeah, um, hadn't read books about it or anything like that. Or even like the, the first ethnobotany conference, um, we actually did a salvia workshop where we just basically handed salvia to people to smoke um, just to see what the, what the reactions were. And there are certain things about salvia that just seem to um, be a, a common thread through experiences. And um, it was definitely seemed to be more friendly with women. Yeah, that's um, that was the overwhelming response. That yeah, a lot of men struggled with it, um, and women just didn't. And for long-term therapeutic use, um, I know that a lot. Uh, a lot yeah, there's quite a few people who use salvia as a as an antidepressant and um, yeah, a PTSD uh, treatment, and uh, none of them are male. I could comment on that, not so much in regards to salvia, but, salvia, but the gender thing. Um, recently I read about a plant, um, I think Gaultheria insipida, it's related to wintergreen, not at all related to ayahuasca, but it's known as the female ayahuasca. And it's claimed that apparently males take this and more or less nothing happens, but for women it, it, it works its magic. And um, as to why that would be, I have no idea, but it's certainly interesting. Um, there's, when, when Torsten talks about salvia, it's the concentrated product for smoking. You've introduced a few people to salvia um, through chewing the leaves and sitting in the dark. Um, it is, isn't it, mostly women who can open themselves to that experience because it is a listening. Well, perhaps so. I mean, it, it seems to me to be extraordinarily good for anxiety disorders as well. And what I found is, is, is women with anxiety, what, 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 they come, what they call anxiety disorders themselves, uh, seem to benefit from it greatly. And to me, uh, reading about the, the folk concept of susto has been very helpful in how I approach this plant. It's the idea of um, a, a, a shock in a place, in a location, uh, disturbing the spirit of that place which then contracts around part of the ejected spirit of the person. And this accounts for the um, loss of soul that a person experiences after the shock. So then it becomes a matter for that person to negotiate with the spirit of the place and to have a controlled re-entry their, of their soul into their, into their body, into their system. Um, so that's, that's where I've really seen 
salvia or exceed. Also, with anxiety disorders, they're often treated with, uh, with pharmaceutical agents, antidepressants, that would make it very difficult to get a, a good effect from a lot of the other classic psychedelic uh, entheogens. Uh, there would be reasons why ayahuasca might not be good for someone on antidepressants. There could be uh, dampened responses to mushrooms. And, and so really, uh, salvia, with its unique pharmacology, uh, and uh, it seems to have a great efficacy for anxiety and also to be a, um, something that isn't ruled out uh, by the use of antidepressants concurrently. Uh, there was an interesting phenomenon uh, to when, um, when salvia first hit the market, um, uh, just as plain leaf uh, and then later on as extract. But as plain leaf, there was a lot of people that couldn't get effect from it. Um, and um, yeah, there's actually, there's still books that claim that salvia is a placebo. Um, yeah, that um, I mean, not current books, but yeah, books from around about that time that state that um, yeah, salvia probably isn't actually active; that it's, a, that it's just placebo. So um, yeah, when you just have a uh, plain leaf um, without it being potentiated, um, uh, there was a lot of males, especially, who just couldn't get effect from it unless you reduce their inhibition slightly. So there was two ways of doing that. One was a little bit of alcohol. Um, and that seemed to get everybody over it. Um, if you, uh, yeah, we, we we used to call them hardheads because you know you just couldn't get through couldn't get through to them. But then um, I actually discovered that if you smoke a little bit of salvia splendens beforehand, um, it opens everybody up to to salvia. And salvia splendens itself has virtually no effect. Um, if you make an extract of it, you can sometimes get it to the point where it just relaxes you a little bit. But it just seems to be that little bit of yeah. Opening you up to um, uh, to make you more susceptible to salvia, um, and that's again uh, mostly a male problem. I, I guess with with gardening, there's an element of plant breeding, and it depends on what problems you're encountering. I mean, a lot of gardening is very pragmatic, very very practical. Um, not so much in the breeding of of but in the in the breeding of uh, of Brugmansia. Um, I, I, I notice there are there are issues where I have to make decisions. Uh, I'm interested in some mutant clones from the Subundai Valley in Colombia and trying to conserve them. Uh, but some of them, uh, Quindae, hummingbird borrachero, hummingbird intoxicator, it is a, a, a very magical plant, but it doesn't have very good resistance to fungal diseases of the stems. So I sometimes have to consider, well, I would like to try to maintain its characteristics, but if I can get better stem blight resistance, that would be good. So this stuff is very, very pragmatic. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, and obviously the medicinal effect of the plant is paramount. It's the paramount consideration, but if, if the plant's not going to thrive because it's unable to, to deal with uh, uh, fungal resistance or other issues, then it had to address that as well. So yes, we will be shaping uh, the, the evolution of these species if we continue to have these relationships with them. just want to comment on the, uh, the first thing you said about that you, know, you can just grow it on a mango tree. You don't actually have to grow it on a tree at all. Um, one of the plants that I planted, I uh, planted just in a very open area, I planted a small tree next to it, um, and for the first five years the plant was just happy to just be on the ground. Um, it's only once a tree grew and shaded it, um, like, it was actually only once it shaded it, like, even though the tree grew beforehand, and I kept putting leaders up it, and it just didn't want to grow up the tree. But as soon as it shaded it, um, the vine went up the tree, and, um, yeah, killed it three years later. <laughs> um, it's lunchtime. Um, can you join me in thanking this panel of mountainous speakers? I'm sure they'll all be happy to talk plants um, for the rest of the weekend, so just do approach them. That's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you.